How are we going to make it? Where are we going to find the strength to go on? Have you asked yourself that question or have you heard that question being asked very many times? How are we going to overcome our fears? How are we going to overcome our anxiety? How are we going to overcome our worries? How are we going to overcome our temptations to sin, our weaknesses? How are we going to get our lives pointed in the right direction so that we can enjoy heaven? How are we going to find the strength to go on? When I was a kid, I we had as those of you from my generation and older, we only had four channels, right? ABC, CBS, NBC, and PBS. I watched PBS all the time. Sesame Street and The Electric Company and Captain Kangaroo. I was always making those things that Captain Kangaroo made on TV. And The Electric Company. And The Electric Company had a segment on Spider-Man, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, who, of course, was bitten by a radioactive spider, and that's where he got his power. That was my first introduction probably to the web slinger, and so I became a Spider-Man fan as I was growing up. Where does, our, where does our power come from? As we're going to find this morning in our study from Philippians chapter 3, our power comes from the resurrection of Christ. And that power is within us. Where do I get the strength to go on? I get the strength to go on in life through the relationship that I have with God through the resurrected Christ. And so this morning I want us to feed on Philippians chapter 3. At our worship hour we will feed on Philippians chapter 1. Then we'll have three meals from the Gospel of Luke. And then Wednesday night we will conclude our uh, special series of spiritual meals this week on, from Hebrews. The letter of Hebrews. I think it's appropriate as we have this series of lessons to point out that we begin our study this morning from the power of the resurrection of Christ and then we will end our study Wednesday night discussing the power of the blood of Christ. For us as Christians, everything begins and ends with Christ, right? Philippians chapter 3. I want you to observe, first of all, that too often times we put confidence in the flesh. Would you notice what Paul says beginning there in verse 2? Paul says that we are the true circumcision of Christ, true circumcision rather, who worship according to the Spirit of God and give glory to Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else desires to put confidence in the flesh, I am more so circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal of persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. But these things, he says, I count as loss. For the sake of Christ. Family, I want to point out first of all that too often times you and I focus on the flesh. And we put confidence in the flesh. I want you to notice in verse 4, there are verses 3 and 4, verses 2 and 3 rather, Paul uses the phrase confidence in the flesh three times. Is it not true that you and I struggle with fear and with worry, with anxiety, with temptations, because we put confidence in the flesh. We put confidence in the things that we can see, like our spouse or our children or our healthy bank account. We put confidence in the flesh, and that's the reason why we struggle with fear and anxiety. But I want you to notice that the word righteousness in verse 6 Paul says, as to righteousness which is in the law, of course the law of Moses, he says, I was found blameless. But then immediately after that, immediately after saying that I, found, I was found blameless relative to righteousness in the law, he says, I count that as loss for the sake of Christ. 
Paul says, I count it as loss to be considered righteous according to the law. I count that as loss for the sake of Christ. Why? Because Paul came to realize that being righteous according to the law was not enough. Paul came to realize that the sacrifice of bulls and goats did not take away sin. He will say that the only way to be righteous is to be right in Christ. The word righteous, of course, means to be right with God. It means to have a right relationship with God. And Paul uses that word, the New Testament rather, uses that word 92 times. Being right with God. Most often times he uses it in the letter of Romans. Today, how can we be right with God? It's only in Jesus Christ. Not putting confidence in the flesh. And so Paul says here that our problem is, first of all, we put confidence in the flesh. And Paul says, if anybody has a right to put confidence in the flesh, I have more that right. And yet, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. And we go on and we notice in the next verse, in verse 7, verse 8 rather, Paul says, here's our solution to our confidence. More than that, Paul says, would you read his words, verse 8? More than that, Paul says, I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I count all things as rubbish, all things as loss. He says, I suffer all things as loss, and I count them as rubbish so that I might gain Christ. And there's our solution to the confidence that we need. Paul says, I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. <coughs> Family, this week I will be preaching to our minds more so than our hearts because the Bible teaches that if we get our minds pointed in the right direction, everything else is going to follow. If we put our minds in the right place, our hearts are going to follow. Paul says we need to come to understand who Jesus is. The word knowledge is found 29 times in the New Testament. Most often in Paul's letters of 1 and 2 Corinthians. This is the only place it's used in Philippians. The word knowledge. And notice here Paul says in verse 8, I renounce everything for the surpassing, the value of the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Let's observe those designations that Paul gives to Jesus. First of all, He's the Christ. Christ, of course, is the New Testament, the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. means the anointed one. So for Paul to refer to Jesus as Christ means He is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prediction. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, Jesus is the one who fulfills God's plans for mankind. Secondly, Paul refers to Christ as Jesus. Jesus is His human name. Jesus is the Greek translation of the Hebrew name Joshua. It comes from the word salvation. Jesus is His human name. Jesus is His, reflects His humanity. Paul says, I want to know Christ, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, who came in the flesh. He's God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. But He's also, Paul says, Lord. Christ Jesus, my Lord. My Master. My Sovereign. And so Paul says, I want to know Jesus Christ. Now, because Paul had been preaching Christ for several years, and he had been run out of town several times, and he had suffered the loss of many things, a place to sleep, maybe food. He had suffered the loss of his physical health from many different perspectives because of his confession of Christ. And Paul says, I count all of that as rubbish. Now this is the only time this word rubbish is used in the New Testament. It can mean garbage, it can mean trash, it can even mean dung. Paul says, I count all of this as trash 
when I compare it with the surpassing value of having a relationship with Christ Jesus my Lord. Don't we sing the song, Earth holds no treasure but perishes with using, however precious they may be. And yet there's a country to which I am going. Heaven holds all to me. That song reflects the sentiments of the Apostle Paul here in verse 8. I'll suffer the loss of everything in order to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's not put confidence in the flesh. Let's put our minds in the gear and allow our hearts and our behavior to follow where our mind leads us. And that's into the arms of Jesus Christ. So Paul's solution is to get to know Jesus Christ. Have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't get to know a figment of your imagination. Family across the country and around the world, the, the, the substance of a lot of people's understanding of Jesus Christ can be summarized in the nativity scene. That's the essence of their understanding of Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why the world suffers from fear and anxiety and temptation and the burden of sin because they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Family, get to know Christ. To know Christ is the same Paul says here as to gain Christ. And so the solution to our confidence is to have a relationship with Christ but let us notice in verse 9, Paul says that the basis for our confidence is in Him. In Him, Paul says, I have a righteousness not of my own that is derived from the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. The basis of our confidence is being in Christ. There are two passages you know that teach us how to get into Christ. Romans 6 verses 3 through 5 and Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 and 27. We are immersed in the waters of baptism into Christ. And so Paul says that that is where the rest of these blessings are found. Once we get into Christ, then we have a basis for our confidence so that we don't have to struggle with fear and temptation and sin. Christ is the basis of this confidence. Paul does not desire that righteousness that is derived from the law. That righteousness that was derived from the law was available through the offerings of animals and you had to do that every time you sinned. You had to do that annually through the Day of Atonement. It's just constant sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Paul says, I don't want that righteousness. I don't want the righteousness that comes through the law because Paul knew that he could not live up to God's expectations without the coming of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I desire the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. The word faith is found 243 times in the New Testament. When I was an undergraduate student at Faulkner University, I had a class on denominational doctrines with Brother Wendell Winkler. And as part of that class, we would have mock debates. And I remember one time Darren Fantroy was debating uh, on the necessity of immersion in water for the forgiveness of sins. And, and he was taking the position that we we're saved by faith only. And so to illustrate that we are saved by faith only, he had uh, printed out all of the verses in the Bible that use the word faith or believe, printed them out on the old dot matrix fanfold paper, and had his moderator hold it up and it stretched almost halfway around the room. All those verses that use the word believe or faith. And then he printed out all the verses that mentioned baptism and he held them up on one sheet of paper. Now that was a very powerful argument for those that don't know the Bible. As we already pointed out, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, Paul says it's immersion in water that unites us together with Christ. It's on the basis of faith. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. It's faith that motivates us to put Christ on in baptism. 
But Paul is clear there. The baptism is what puts us into Christ. And so Paul says, we, I want to be in Him. Let me direct your attention to Philippians chapter 1, verse 25 and verse 27. I want you to notice in these two verses the expression Paul says, talks about being the faith. Verse 25, convinced of this, Paul says, I know that I will remain and continue with you in your progress and joy in the faith. Now when Paul uses the expression the faith, more often than not he was referring to the system that creates faith that is based on Jesus Christ. It's another way of referring to the gospel message about Jesus Christ. I want you to notice verse 27. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, Paul says, so that whether I come and see you or, or remain absent, I will hear of you all that you're standing together in one spirit, striving together for one faith, the faith of the gospel. The faith of the gospel. So the gospel of Christ is that whole system of beliefs that are related to Christ, that flow out of Christ, that are based on Christ, that are given to us in the Bible through the inspiration of the Spirit of God and all of the doctrines that are contained within its pages. That's the faith that Paul is talking about. Now, he's not talking about saying some kind of prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. He is talking about Believing in who Jesus is. And then doing everything that Jesus says to do in order to be right with God. That's faith. And that's what brings about righteousness that Paul's been talking about. Family, the basis of our righteousness is trusting the gospel message of Jesus Christ and doing, obeying everything that He tells us to do. When I preached in Paris, Kentucky, Almost directly across the intersection from the church building was the local uh, nursing home, assisted living facility. And the church would go there twice a month on Sunday afternoons, immediately after Sunday morning worship, and we would just walk the hallway singing uh, songs. And if, there was, if we had a member in that facility, then we would go into his or her room and we would sing three or four extra songs. We had a woman in there, a member of our congregation named Ruth, who was in her 80s. And we stopped off one time and we were, we were going to sing some songs. And I asked her if there's any songs that she would specifically like for us to sing, any songs that she had that were favorites. And she said, I don't know why God hasn't taken me yet. She said, I just hope that I'm going to heaven. And I said, Ruth. Jesus says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Do you still believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? She said, yes. I said, have you been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? She said, yes. I said, okay. Do you trust Jesus? Do you trust his word? Paul says the basis of our confidence is being in Christ. But I want you to notice as we move on with our meal this morning from Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul says, here's the power of our confidence. Notice the power of our confidence, Paul says, is being in Him. He's mentioned Jesus Christ, His Lord, back in verse 8. And so Paul says, we want to know Christ, Jesus my Lord. Now verse 10, he says, being in Him. I want to know Him. He says, I want to be so intimate with Jesus Christ that His life, His teachings, His values are reflected in my life. Paul says, I want to eat His flesh and drink His blood. That's the words of Jesus from John chapter 6. Of course, being used figuratively. But Paul says, I want to think like Jesus and I want the words coming out of my mouth to be Jesus' words. I want His love to be in my heart. I want to know Jesus Christ. I want to breathe the air that He breathes. I want to speak His words. Secondly, Paul says, I want to know the power of His resurrection. The Greek word for power is used 119 times in the New Testament New Testament. 
a large percentage of that time, if not most of the time, the word powers is used to refer to miracles. The miraculous works of God that he worked out through Jesus and through his apostles. Of course, Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection from the dead. So we look at the resurrection from the dead and we see the ultimate expression of the power of God to take away sin and to take away the anxieties that we feel. The power is available to us, of course, Paul says in chapter 6 of Romans when we're immersed into Christ. Paul makes that connection in Romans 6. What power is available through the resurrection of Christ? The forgiveness of our sins. Being able to stand before God as holy and blameless in the eyes of God. Innocent and pure. That's the power that comes through the resurrection of Christ and our knowledge of that power the resurrection of Jesus is the center of our existence as Christians. And that's why we celebrate it every single Lord's Day. Because we draw power from that resurrection. And we ought to be reminded of it. The word resurrection is found 42 times in the New Testament. That's how important the resurrection is and that's how it is related to our existence as Christians. We look forward to our resurrection because of our connection with the resurrected Christ. This is the word's only use in the, new to, in the, the letter of Philippians. But that, that resurrection gives hope and it gives power. It gives a, a framework to our lives. I don't know where you're going to go tomorrow. Maybe you're retired. Maybe you're going to work. Maybe you're going to school. But the power of the resurrection provides a framework for our lives and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Notice also there in verse 10 that Paul says, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Fellowship means engaging in activity with. After our worship this morning, we're going to have a fellowship meal. We're going to participate together in a meal. That is fellowship. If you look back at chapter 1 and verse 5, and we're going to look at this verse at our worship hour in the context of prayer, but Paul says, I pray for you Philippian Christians with joy in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. That word fellowship or participation in chapter 1 verse 5 is this word fellowship in Philippians 3 and verse 10. They were engaging in joint activity with Paul and sharing the gospel of Christ. And Paul says, I want to know the joint participation in the sufferings of Christ. Now what does that mean? What does it mean that Paul wants to be so united together with Christ that he can participate in his sufferings? Paul says, I want to be so united together with Christ that if it means me suffering as Christ suffered, then so be it. You remember that Paul was in prison in Rome when he writes this letter to Christians in Philippi because he was preaching the gospel of Christ. Paul says, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul tells the Christians in Corinth that the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, but the comfort that comes from God through Christ are also ours in abundance. So Paul identifies the suffering in the very next phrase here in Philippians 3 and verse 10. Notice what he says, conforming to his death. Well, how did Paul conform to the death of Christ? Christ died on a cross. Paul didn't die on a cross. Paul was beheaded, if we can trust early church history. How did Paul conform to the death of Christ? Christ died for the sins of man. Paul can't die for the sins of man. Paul can't use his life. He could give up his life. He can wear himself out. 
in sharing the gospel of Christ, but Paul can't give his life for the sins of mankind, how can Paul conform to the death of Christ? I suggest to you that Jesus gave his life willingly. You recall in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times Jesus prayed, let this cup pass from me, the cup of suffering. The Old Testament prophets, and we see this reflected in the book of Revelation, the Old Testament prophets refer to the cup of, of God's wrath. Jesus says, I've got to drink from that cup. I've got to experience the wrath of God on, on the behalf of my human creation. But Jesus did that willingly. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 that Jesus, although He were a son, learned obedience through the things that He suffered. And being made perfect, He became the author, the initiator, the originator, eternal salvation to all those who obey Him. I think that's how Paul could conform to the death of Christ and participate in the sufferings of Christ. By willingly giving himself for others. To know the fellowship and the participation of Christ's sufferings. Now, if you go back to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20, you will see there where Paul says that his desire is to be with Christ but he says, if I have to live here on earth, it's for the betterment of you all so that I can continue teaching you the gospel of Christ. But whether in life or in death, I want Christ exalted. Family, the possibility of us dying in service to Christ is perhaps what motivated Paul to talk about the death of Christ in chapter 2 and verse 8 where he says, Jesus humbled Himself even unto the death on the cross in order to reconcile us to the Father. Can anything less be expected of us today in the 21st century to become obedient to Jesus Christ even to the point of death? Paul is going to use Epaphroditus as an example in chapter 2, beginning in verse 30. He says, Epaphroditus came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in service from the Philippians. Paul saw his life simply as a gift to offer back to God. Not in payment, but as a gift to God for what God had done for him through Jesus Christ. Finally, if you look back at our text, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 11, Paul says he desires to know if perhaps he may attain, arrive at the resurrection from the dead. Now this word resurrection is not the same word that was used back up in verse 10. But Paul says he wants to be raised from the dead. Isn't that what we want? Don't we want to continue living forever? Isn't that the reason why we take heart medication? Blood thinner? We want to continue living. We do all kinds of things to our bodies. I'm not criticizing that, but the point is we want to continue living. We want to put off death as long as possible. God offers to us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Paul says, I want to attain the resurrection of the dead. We finally arrived at the solution to our problem, the basis and its power. Righteousness is obtained by faith in Jesus Christ so that we can attain the resurrection from the dead so that we can enjoy eternal life. Maybe my favorite Disney movie is Brother Bear. It's usually not very high on the list of the most popular Disney movies. I have two girls, and so we spend a lot more time watching princess movies. But I've got two brothers. And so Brother Bear struck home to me maybe a little more than it did to my girls. 
It came out in 2003. We were living in Romania. My family, my wife and daughters and I were missionaries in the country of Romania and Eastern Europe for seven and a half years. So it came out while we were over there and somebody sent us a copy of it and so we watched it. If you're not familiar with the movie, very briefly, here's what it's about. An Inuit boy named Kenai pursues a bear in revenge for a fight that he himself provoked in which his oldest brother Sitka was killed. Kenai kills that bear, but the spirits decide to punish Kenai by making him into a bear. And the only way to break that spell is for him to travel to the mountains where the northern lights touch the earth. Along the way, Kenai is joined by another bear, a bear cub, and we learn to see through another's eyes, feel through another's heart, and come to learn what the true meaning of brotherhood is. Phil Collins sang the soundtrack that went with that movie, and I want to share with you the lyrics for one of those songs. Everywhere I turn, I hurt someone, but there's nothing I can say that's changed the things I've done. Of all the things I hid from you, I cannot hide the shame, and I pray someone, something, will come to take away the pain. There's no way out of this dark place, no hope, no future. I know I can't be free, but I can't see another way, and I can't face another day. Have you ever in your life reached that point? Tell me where did I go wrong? Everyone I love, they're all gone. I do everything so differently, but I can't turn back the time. There's no shelter from the storm inside of me. There's no way out of this dark place. No hope, no future. I know I can't be free, but I can't see another way and I can't face another day. I can't believe the words I hear. It's like an answer to a prayer. When I look around, I see this place, this time, this friend of mine. I know it's hard, but you found someone to look into your heart and notice this next phrase, and to forgive me now. You've given me the strength to see just where my journey ends. You've given me the strength to carry on. I see the path from this dark place. I see my future. Your forgiveness has set me free. Oh, and I can see another way. I can face another day. Where does the power come from? to help us overcome our fears and our worries and our anxieties. The strength to overcome the temptations that we struggle with in life, the desire that we have in our hearts to, to, to live right and to honor God, to glorify our Savior Jesus Christ. Where does the strength to come from to carry on? Family, the Apostle Paul has taught us here in Philippians chapter 3 that that strength comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That strength comes from our relationship with Christ. The power of God comes from our connection to the resurrected Christ. It comes from having the right perspective in life. God will help us deal with the less important matters in life, like paying our mortgage, because He wants us to enjoy this most important matter in life. And that's the resurrection of Christ. Our strength to carry on comes from our connection to the resurrected Christ. Let's stop putting confidence in the flesh. And let's count all things as trash in view of the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. And having a relationship with Christ, we can attain the resurrection from the dead. God bless you. God bless our meeting this week. And may God bless the study of His Word. Thank you.